good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are right now. Um, so it's really our pleasure to invite all of you, welcoming all of you who are present today. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, uh, Sogato Bose and uh, Andy and myself, Anupam, um, it's great that uh, we could see all of you via virtually, if not uh, really physical, in a physical world. But also we would like to thank um, ICTP, uh, SAFAR, for organizing, hosting this workshop for all of us. It's a, it's a great platform and they were very willing to help us, especially the director of ICTP. So thanks, to, a great thanks to them. Um, so with this, uh, well, just a couple of um, things which I would like to mention. Um, uh, I would request every one of you to mute yourself. And if you have questions, please uh, put your questions in the chat message and Andy will pick it up. He is chairing our first session. And, um, and then after the talk, you, are, you, you have some time to ask questions to, the, to all the speakers, so please do so. It's a very interactive uh, workshop, so we are hoping that after the every uh, you know, break, uh, like um, mid-break and, uh, and towards the end of the day, we'll have panel discussion. So do participate and ask questions to the speakers, and uh, I hope that this will be fruitful to every one of us. A um, couple of uh, things, uh, maybe uh, it's my apologies, uh, especially to the, all the speakers because I sent an email yesterday and I mentioned 30 plus five minutes. It's my bad. It should be 25 plus five minutes. So please try your best to keep it in 25 plus five minutes. Um, that will help us uh, to maintain the time and that's all. So with, uh, without any further uh, delay, I hand it over to today's uh, chairperson, uh, Andy, uh, who is going to chair the morning session for us. Andy, please. Thanks. Thank you, Anya Paman. I'd like to echo Anya Paman. Welcome everyone to this uh, conference that I'm very excited uh, to, to be co-chairing uh, co, uh, today. And um, so <clears throat> uh, I'd like to um, start off just by um, um, uh, uh, welcoming everyone again. And, uh, and our, I'm excited about our first session this morning, which is going to be mainly focused on some of the theoretical aspects uh, of of the challenges for observing quantum effects related to gravity in the lab. And our, and our first speaker is Carlo Rovelli, who's coming from uh, Marseille University. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'm actually uh, indeed formally in Marseille, but in Canada right now. Ah. <laughs> uh, this is the world. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, here it is. So, um, yeah. Uh, I am a theoretician uh, completely, so uh, this is going to be um, uh, nothing about a concrete implementation of uh, experiments. I want to focus on why uh, I think what where is exactly the theoretical interest of these experiments uh, for me, namely for a person doing uh, quantum gravity, having worked on quantum gravity uh, all through life. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the gravity-mediated uh, uh, entanglement and the possibility of seeing it uh, in the laboratory. I'll focus uh, on uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the kind of proposals of which I uh, know more and which I've been uh, uh, initially aware that uh, got me very uh, excited. And I'll use the fact that this is, this is the first of the presentation for give you for give a sort of a, uh, rapid theoretical overview of uh, uh, the way I view um, I view this. So I'm going to do three things. First of all, um, uh, explain uh, why they're interesting from my uh, perspective and what is the level of interest. Um, let me anticipate that uh, for me these are major uh, experiments if they can be done. So if they can be done, uh, this it. It, it might be a result uh, uh, of, uh, of enormous uh, uh, importance. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to argue to argue what. I mean, like the gravitational waves detection or, or seeing the black holes. Um, second, I'll try to say exactly what they teach us. And then, uh, I mean, in spite of the 25 minutes, I'll take just a, a, a couple, a, a two or three minutes at the end uh, um, to talk uh, of some possibility of long, very long-term perspective. I mean, supposing we can do that, uh, what we can do next and better. And I think this is interesting also because it uh, uh, it, it shows that this direction it's, uh, it, it can be even fruitful on the longer uh, on the longer term. So let me start from um, why they are uh, interesting. Um, I start from something um, uh, rather obvious. It's it's uh, uh, I think it's clear to many people here, but let me uh, restress it. Um, 
conceptually is completely different to um, consider the quantum effects of matter in a gravitational field from distinguishing that from the quantum properties of gravity uh, itself. Uh, if you think about electromagnetism, uh, one thing it's uh, uh, electron, neutrons, uh, whatever you think about uh, uh, quantum with their quantum properties uh, in a uh, static electric field or in a variable electric field or in a magnetic field, uh, uh, something completely different. It's the quantum properties of the electromagnetic field. Um, the first kind of uh, uh, phenomena are beautifully explored in, uh, in, in, in many current uh, uh, experiments. Uh, there will be a lot to say that. I'm not going into that because the, uh, the interest here is about the second. We don't have any, um, any uh, observation about the quantum properties of gravity uh, itself, not just in the lab, but all over in the universe. So uh, everything we, we see so far, unless we speculate that something may be previously related to this and that, everything we see, it's accounted by classical generativity and uh, uh, matter which behaves quantum uh, mechanically. However, um, we are strongly convinced, uh, it's, I mean, a large majority of theoreticians are strongly convinced that gravity, it's, it's, uh, it's like the electromagnetic field, so it has quantum properties. So seeing this quantum property would be, as I said, a, a major quantum result. And that's, I think, the, uh, the interest of the, these experiments. Now, the world seeing by the theoretician is different than the world seeing by an experimentalist. An experimentalist sort of thinks that everything is possible and just go and check. Uh, an experimentalist, a, a theoretician doesn't view the world this way because the actual surprises from nature are very rare. Uh, extremely rare in fundamental physics. You can count the number of uh, a single finger. Uh, we actually feel that we know exactly a lot. We know a lot about quantum gravity. And the reason is that because there are a lot of theories about quantum gravity. Um, I've listed three here, but there are, there are more. Uh, so let me mention just standard perturbative uh, quantization of general relativity, um, the framework of effective field theory. Um, you, you cannot do calculations for phenomena that involve too high energy, but for low energy, you can compute very well and you have very precise results. You have loop quantum gravity, which I've worked all my life, um, which also uh, give you very clear uh, sense of what you what to expect from a quantum gravitational phenomena at, at, at the scale of a laboratory. And the same is from string theory, the same is from uh, asymptotic safety uh, and so on. And the point is that all these theories agree completely on the predictions about uh, what you can measure in the lab. At least for now, the last point, which I'm gonna go at the end of the talk, uh, will be uh, gonna get out from, uh, uh, from that. But this is you know, far away in the future, not uh, as the experiments how they are conceived uh, uh, today. So there's no hope of distinguishing be, uh, uh, between these theories uh, uh, with lab experiments uh, for the moment, as, see, as far as I know. I mean, maybe somebody comes out with idea, but I've seen uh, any. So the point is not to distinguish between these theories um, uh, so far. Um, there are theories, there are some um, uh, experimental exp explorations uh, that would predict something different and uh, uh, two directions essentially, either the possibility that gravity is always classical, namely that the, the two equations of the world are classical general relativity sourced by quantum matter in this way here, that the standard uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, sometimes called semi-classical uh, quantum gravity. So uh, one may argue, well, gravity is really different than the other thing. So maybe it's really all the way classical. That's one possibility. Uh, which can be realized uh, directly from these equations or using a statistical description of, of, of gravity in a little bit more sophisticated way. Or the second possibility is that uh, um, uh, gravity uh, uh, undergoes quantum uh, phenomena, but not too much. 
uh, which is a, a, an idea. Uh, I mean, Roger Penrose, for instance, has, uh, has proposed uh, uh, that this is a possibility. Um, so that um, uh, uh, sort of quantum superposition of geometry is limited by Planck scale, essentially, by, 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 by one graviton or, or one Planck mass um, uh, effect. Now, these two possibilities would be distinguishable from the um, gravity-induced experiment in the lab. So you can see quantum gravity-induced uh, gravity experiment in the lab as ways to rule out this possibility or to check this possibility. <clears throat> and once again, I, 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 I go back to my previous um, uh, general comment. Uh, often from an experiment, I say, everything is possible, let's go and see. But from a theoretician, you know what to expect. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, what, what you expect comes out. Um, which doesn't mean we shouldn't go and see. I, the point is that to see what, what, what we, 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 we expect, right? We did expect gravitational wave. We did expect the, the picture of the black hole. And the great result is that we saw exactly what, what, what you expected. I mean, so. Um, so um, what I'm saying is that lab experiments can uh, count uh, as uh, uh, falsifications of these theories, or, I mean, I don't believe you ever really actually falsify things or putting stringent limits on these theories, putting this theory in, in the street corner. Uh, but I think the um, interest is to witness a quantum gravitational phenomenon. That would be uh, absolutely major. Now, one um, other comment, um, I don't wanna, I don't have time to go into a full, uh, historical thing about experiments done in the past, but there are a lot of experiments in the uh, in the um, done, performed, or or studied, or being studied that present themselves as quantum gravity in the lab. And if I can spend a lot of time of my life being a quantum gravity theoretician, look at all of them, <clears throat> and uh, I want to tell you why these experiments excited me and the others did not, because. A lot of other experiments check potential uh, quantum gravity effects that are not predicted by the theories which we think are plausible. So the most likely outcome is negative, which is fine. They just rule out some extreme possibility. But you know, <clears throat> what's the point? I mean, you think that some funny quantum gravity phenomenon unexpected could, could, could happen. You check, it doesn't happen exactly at the previous point. While these uh, gravity-induced entanglement check a remarkable effect that, that is predicted by uh, what we think we know about quantum gravity. Um, and this has the result that if the result is done and the, 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 the outcome it's, uh, uh, it's positive, that's it. We have evidence that gravity is quantized. Just uh, uh, one, uh, one way of thinking about this uh, experiment, a very, uh, very, very fast. Uh, um, uh, so uh, one possibility is to consider two, uh, two nanoparticles. I'm, I'm, you know, I know there are variants and I uh, look forward also for uh, things I don't know during this conference. Uh, but this is the one I met and, uh, and uh, excited me a lot as a theoretician. Um, you have two, two small particles. You put uh, both of them in a superposition of two, uh, two different positions so that in the different branches, there are different distance. The different distance has the effect that the four branches, two by two, evolve slightly different because of the effect of gravity. And this gives a phase. Uh, the phase is different in the four branches. So the result is that you entangle this particle. If you entangle this particle, um, the two particles are entangled by a phase which is generated by, uh, by gravity. Cal computing this phase, I'll come back uh, in a moment, can be done in 10 possible ways. They all agree. And uh, uh, the phase is of the order um, uh, Newton constant or Planck constant. Uh, the mass, if these are the same mass, the mass square uh, divided by uh, the, uh, the, the, the distance uh, between the two, um, which is different, that's the point, in, in, in the various uh, uh, branches, uh, times the time during which they, they, uh, they stay together. And you know, surprising things, which I learned from Sugato, is that if you, if you take nanoparticle and you sort of estimate how close they, uh, uh, you can put them, uh, t's of order of second, which perhaps is not, uh, is not impossible. So this, uh, another way of seeing the entanglement would show that gravity, um, uh, has this effect. And the key point here is that uh, uh, one particle 
uh, the effect is given by the fact that one particle, one branches, uh, uh, sees the two different fields of the gravitation of gravitational uh, in the two branches which are different. So for this to happen necessarily, uh, the gravitational field must be in a superposition. In other words, this is not going to happen if gravity is classical in one of the two ways I, 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 I said before. And let me go slowly here because this has been as raised as some discussion. Um, you can, let me go back, you can compute this um, phase or you can compute this effect uh, in all sorts of ways, including just go to the non relativistic limit and treat. Um, the gravitational interaction as an instantaneous interaction at a distance. Of, obviously you can, right? Because you're deep into this regime. Uh, so what does this tell us about a field theory of gravity if you do a calculation in a, um, uh, it, it, using a formula where gravity is not a field? Well, nothing unless you fold in some other uh, knowledge that we do have about the world. So the effort can be computed assuming quantum particles and a long range instantaneous Newtonian interaction. But we know, we are deeply convinced that there are no long range instantaneous interactions. Therefore, we know that the long range instantaneous interaction are an approximation of something else, are a first approximation of something else. So if we fold this knowledge in, we see that uh, the field theory that uh, carries these instantaneous interactions uh, must be different in different branches. And if it's different in the branches, it is in a superposition. If we further fold in the information that we know, we have strongly from general relativity. General relativity is the most successful classical theory ever after Maxwell probably, uh, certainly I would say. Um, then we know that this gravitational field is the geometry of space-time, or more precisely, the geometry of the space-time is just a, uh, a feature, a, something we measure out of the gravitational field. So therefore, um, a positive result of this experiment, uh, plus our theoretical knowledge of uh, uh, essentially special relativity, which tell us that there's a field behind that, and general relativity that tell us that this field is um, uh, what determines uh, the geometry of space time has as a consequence unavoidable on the basis of what we know that um, uh, uh, space time metric is in a quantum superposition, which is quite spectacular because we expect so, but we have never seen a direct effect uh, of, of, uh, of that. Now, one comment about uh, some uh, um, uh, criticism to this idea that I've floated in the literature along the line that uh, this is uh, this just is the Newtonian part of the field. And these uh, are uh, sort of non-dynamical degrees of freedom where the true dynamical degrees of freedom are radiative modes, um, uh, gravitational waves, uh, if you want. I think this is uh, uh, deeply misleading as an observation because uh, um, for the following reason, of course you can take the gravitational field and split in this way, but this split is not a split of different degrees of freedom, it's profoundly unphysical because if this split was a split uh, between degrees of freedom, both the Newtonian and the radiative uh, degrees of freedom would behave dramatically non-local. You know, if I take a mass and move a little bit, instantaneously it's Newtonian potential changes in Andromeda, right? We, we know that that's not the way nature uh, works because it's, uh, uh, it's local. So the distinction between the Newtonian part and the radiative part, <clears throat> it's very good for doing calculation, especially in, 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 in some situation. In cosmology, you use it. It's, uh, it, it's very good for, for, for organizing your thing, but it's not a uh, distinction between physical, different physical degrees of freedom. Or in other words, there is no coherent theory uh, where information uh, 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 goes not faster than light, classical information goes not fast, faster than light, where one part of these uh, uh, variables could be quantized and the other not, right? So there's no local field theory that could have uh, a quantum gravitational part quantized without the Newtonian part at the same time allowed to be in a superposition. Therefore, uh, once again, uh, uh, knowledge of gravity plus a uh, positive result uh, uh, implies that the uh, space-time geometry is uh, um, in a uh, superposition. Now, if you we, how am I doing with time? Good, very well. Um, 
if we view things this way, we might ask, all right, so instead of viewing this uh, sort of non-relativistically as an action at a distance, uh, can view it can we view it relativistically in, in just genuinely space-time terms like a relativist like me could, uh, could do? Yes, of course. Um, and obviously we, we're supposed to get the same result without an, a, a, an instantaneous action at the distance. And how does this work? Well, it's even more beautiful. In fact, uh, I think this is the most beautiful way of viewing this, uh, um, this phenomena, uh, which is the following. Um, in each of the four branches, the field, namely the gravitational field, in a very short time adjusted to a uh, essentially static, uh, goes rapidly to a static situation. So there is some totally relevant radiation that goes out that transform the field of the particle before the split in a superposition of two fields, each one having this form. Okay, after the uh, the split, namely the the, the G zero zero component of the metric uh, in, in in the best coordinate you can think about that, in the natural coordinate you can think about that, is sourced by the Newtonian potential one particle and the other particle, which means that if you are on one, if you are this particle here, if you are one of these branches, you are in a superposition of two geometries which are different, in which the proper time along this uh, uh, trajectory while you're staying there for a coordinate time t is different. So you can compute the difference of the proper time and it's just an elementary calculation in uh, uh, classical general relativity. You get this term here, noted c square here downstairs. It's a very small, very teeny difference of uh, proper time between, uh, careful, not between different particles or different component of the particle. The same particle is in a two different, the same particle, the same component of the particle is in two different branches because of the other one is split. Uh, and the uh, proper time difference between the two is this teeny, teeny number here because it's the C squared before. You put it, I mean, forget long-term interaction. You just put it in the uh, 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 mass over H bar uh, T uh, standard uh, um, uh, phase evolution and you find that uh, there's a different of evolution a uh, different phase and the different phase you can you you, you just recover uh, you cover the previous one so this is fantastic because uh, from this perspective which of course gives the same number as before but from this perspective what you're doing is a very delicate interference experiment between two times the time it takes the particle um, to, to go from here to here. So to stay there in, in a coordinate time t in one branch and in another. And this will come useful um, in, uh, in a moment. So uh, once again, from this perspective, we, we see it uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, a um, uh, relativistic way. The, 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 the relativistic description of the, of, of the result tells you exactly the superposition is due to superposition of the metric. And you see immediately that this is gonna uh, not happen um, if, uh, if these are the fundamental equations or uh, a statistical version of that, and you, do, you have to put some numbers in, you see it's, uh, uh, it wouldn't happen in a gravity induced collapse at the, uh, given some parameters. Good, I have uh, uh, a few minutes left for the third uh, point of my presentation, which is uh, um, uh, a bit independent from, uh, from this. And uh, it's, uh, suppose we can do that. I think uh, all this will, should go on the front page of all the major newspapers, so in evidence for uh, geometry being in quantum superposition. Um, what next? Uh, is that, that's it? I, no, because I think these, uh, uh, kind of experiments open up actually a possibility of testing quantum gravity far beyond just the um, proof that uh, geometry is a quantum superposition. And I want to mention an idea which is uh, 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 speculative. It's there's some uh, some uh, it's a lot of width, uh, a lot of if uh, on which it is based. Uh, uh, but I find uh, extremely uh, challenging. Suppose we can push, we can do this, you guys, you experimentalists can do this, and uh, then we can push the uh, sensitivity with a few, few order of magnitudes uh, more. So I know this is not behind the corner, <clears throat> but the following uh, remarkable 
can be done. You, you can start distinguishing between different quantum theory of gravity, and you can see a genuine relativistic quantum effect of gravity, right? That's, I mean, the, the one I've talked about is a non-relativistic quantum gravitational effect. It's like the classical superposition, it's a quantum superposition of two electric fields. You can do that, but it's a non-relativistic phenomenon. But you can go to a relativistic uh, one, why? Because look at the phase, which I just computed before, and uh, uh, notice that um, the, uh, the phase can be written in the following way, uh, just uh, rewriting with, with the constant. The mass of the Planck mass, uh, delta T over T Planck, which means that if the same experiment can be done with masses that come close to the Planck mass, which I remember is just a fraction, a tenth of a microgram, Right? So if, we, if you can scale up from nanoparticles to uh, tens of a microgram particles, uh, getting a measurable delta phi, so delta phi of order one, the interference that you measure is due to a delta t, a difference in proper time of the order of the Planck time. And there you have a genuine no, uh, uh, relativistic quantum gravity effect. So um, quant loop quantum gravity predicts some sort of discreteness. So imagine very simply that discreteness, uh, that delta t is quantized in integers time the, the Planck time. Then you find that uh, the phase can only take, the, the, the change, the difference of phase, the, the phasing can only take certain values, um, discrete values. So as you change a parameter continuously, let's say the time or the distance, uh, uh, the entanglement, this is the entropy, the entanglement entropy would not change continuously, but it would change discontinuously. It's a typical quantum step uh, kind of uh, uh, result. Now, uh, it's Carlos, not obvious- to interrupt, yeah? you have about five minutes left, just-, yeah. just yeah. thank you. So, so uh, this is, uh, uh, I just, you know, if you want to look at the paper for, for, for details, the, the, the condition for this to be true, so it's this discussion. But the point is that uh, some order of magnitude beyond uh, w w this kind of direction, one might hope in the future to actually see <clears throat> genuine discreteness of time, which would be fantastic because uh, it seems impossible to, uh, to see something that discreteness of time or discreteness of space, uh, but these are uh, interference phenomena between proper time and you know interference is incredibly powerful. That's how LIGO works to picking up a very teeny, uh, very teeny effect. So that's my conclusion. Um, I, I mentioned three points: why uh, this uh, gravity mediated entangle are interesting, uh, what do they teach us, and uh, uh, long term. Uh, and, and I mentioned this idea about long term perspective. They're interesting because uh, um, uh, uh, it's uh, they uh, bring up a genuine quantum gravitational phenomenon, no relativistic genuine quantum gravitational phenomenon. Um, uh, space time geometry. Uh, they show explicitly that uh, uh, space time geometry can be in a quantum superposition folding in the, the, the knowledge we have about um, uh, field theory uh, and, uh, and general relativity. Uh, so they teach us that the ideas on which uh, decades of quantum gravity research, not just in loop quantum gravity as I'm doing, but including all, most of the other quantum gravity directions are correct. So it would be a, a, a powerful support of an entire set of directions. So we were not uh, blind in all being convinced that this is the case. And they teach us that um, classical gravity or gravity induced uh, um, entanglement are uh, disfavored by observation in nature. Long term perspective, perhaps uh, if this is done and things can be do a few order of magnitude better, we could even hope to see the discreteness of time. I stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Carla, for that really interesting and stimulating talk to start off our workshop. So um, I, there was uh, one question, I guess, in the chat, uh, Marcus Esselmeyer. Yeah, thanks, Carlo, for this um, incredibly clear uh, talk. This was really fantastic. I have a question on the, on the third part, the long-term perspective. Uh, admittedly, I have not yet read the paper with uh, Marios. Um, the question is uh, on the Planck time. So this is an incredibly small number, an awfully small number, like 10 to the minus 40 something seconds. 
Um, so would that mean that here on the x-axis of your figure two, this would also be uh, in steps of the Planck time? Oh, no, no, no. Obviously not. I mean, that's... Yeah. that's <laughs> no, so I, what, how, no. how do we jump? How do we jump the orders of magnitude? <laughs> no, no, that would be out of... Uh, no, no, no. On the, on the x-axis, uh, uh, you have the coordinate time, uh, which changes from, uh, uh, from zero to one second. Um, or or, or uh, whatever determines the phase, uh, the, the small fee, the small, the smallness come from. Um, uh, if you look at these two oh, equations here, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you see, right. delta phi yeah. there is no there is no speed of light, mm -hmm. uh, but it comes by plugging this delta t here in this one here, and here there is a c square downstairs, here there is a c square upstairs, and they cancel. So you have a C square that works in your favor. Namely, um, uh, if you view the effect in this way, uh, you can view the effect as checking something that is C square times smaller mm -hmm. than your time. So the, 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 the I time I can manipulate okay. is this big T here, but what gives the effect is not the T, is the delta T, which is C squared smaller. No, I mean, okay. that would be, it would be silly, yeah. Well, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you, because this is, uh, <laughs> this is often a source of confusion. Yeah. And then it looks like we have a question from Igor. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hello. Carlos. Hello. Yeah. Uh, oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can hear okay. you. Yes. So thanks for the great talk. Um, also, my question is about the third part. Uh, it's a very interesting idea, uh, but I'm curious. Uh, I don't see... Uh, just on first side, how is it relevant that this system would be quantum uh, for the following question, namely, if you assume fundamental that there is this kind of uh, Planck uh, steps in time, then, you know, I could probably just, you know, look at a classical system moving the Newtonian limit, well, I can always write as you did in proper time, and then one would get even a much bigger effect in the classical limit at very, uh, for very strong masses. So I don't see anything here related. Why, why, why is it relevant is a relative phase in quantum for testing this Planck steps evolution? Uh, not sure I've got the question exactly, but the, 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 the delta T is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So uh, any, any actual direct time measurements is just, you know, 20 order of magnitudes. Uh, you, you don't see it because it's too small. Uh, the, 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 the hope to see something like that could be only through an interference phenomenon, uh, which, uh, uh, which compares uh, two times which are teeny, but, but, but you should have a quantum interference that makes up, uh, so, so that makes up uh, let me let me let me put it in, in other words. If you had any idea, any other idea of how to see it, uh, just let me know. I mean, everybody has spent uh, it is decades that people ask themselves, well, if space is quantized at the Planck scale, ten to the minus thirty three centimeters, and 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 time is quantized uh, at the at, at the Planck scale, then how do we see it? And nobody has ever came out with an idea. Remarkably, this is an idea. This is a concrete idea. Uh, again. Take it with caution. I'm not even sure it works, uh, but uh, if you have better ideas, let me know. Okay, it looks like we have made time for one more quick question. Uh, there's a hand raised by uh, Vivo1820. <laughs> no. Igor? Hello? V Vivo? I had one question. I had one question. Okay. My question is, that, uh, are the discreteness of time indicates a non-commutative space-time geometries? Oh, is that the question? Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes, uh, in, in, in the specific sense uh, in which in loop quantum gravity, uh, you have a non-commutative. Uh, uh, you have non-commutative aspect of the geometry. So the, the different components of the metric field uh, do not commute with one another. But but, but if the space-time geometries are non-commutative, then how do you define the metric? Uh, you know, I I cannot 
in 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 an answer. Uh, Oh, oh yeah, actually, it's in, the, in exactly the same manner in which in electromagnetism, in quantum electromagnetism, electric and magnetic field do not commute, right? In yes. quantum theory, yes. therefore you have photons, uh, therefore the, there is discreteness in the way electromagnetic waves arrive on a, and nevertheless, in the, in the, in the, in, in the limit in which you can disregard H bar, uh, you can describe electromagnetism with a classical electromagnetic wave. Exactly in the same manner, in loop quantum gravity, you have a description of the geometry because of some non-commutativity, but then you have a limit, which is the limit in which we usually live and we do all our physics, um, in which you're large compared to the Planck scale, where uh, you don't see the non-commutativity any anymore, so you have, a, you have a standard metric. Okay, thank you. And just uh, to, to, to maybe, um, if I may just, uh, Two seconds. With respect to eager previous questions, uh, it might be that uh, the, the answer is, is the same that Marcus was saying. Uh, we're not, we don't have to manipulate Planck time to see uh, 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 discreteness of time uh, uh, so small. That's the point. We, 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 we can manipulate things of the order of a second, you know, with 1% precision, whatever. And uh, uh, since delta t is proportional to t, uh, then uh, um, uh, with the one over c square, we are observing a phenomenon which is much, much smaller than what we can manipulate. So, thanks. And then what, before we move on, one more quick follow-up question for Marcus. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Exactly in the same direction. Um, so if I rephrase Igor's question, um, uh, ah, shouldn't good. that so shouldn't that then so shouldn't such an effect um, then also be observable if I have a quantum system in a superposition, let's say a clock in a superposition in a classical field like the Earth, classical gravitational field, where I also have superposition of proper times? Um, maybe so. Wouldn't wouldn't you produce also an effect like that? So I guess I can leave it as an uh, open question also. Uh, yeah, sure. But, uh, but uh, of course, but to, to, to measure it, you have to, uh, to have a clock with a precision uh, that uh, usually the clock itself should, uh, uh, should, uh, should have the required precision. We are okay. we are ten to the minus sixteen in delta no, nineteen. Mm. I don't know delta t is over t. Uh, so this sounds yeah. like a good. Oh, I good see. Discussion I see what to... you're saying. I see what you're saying. Well, to... let, uh, maybe uh, we don't have time to go into this. Yeah, yeah. This, this sounds we, like we a perfect. Continue, perfect we can continue uh, in detail. For, uh, for yeah, we, we will continue. Longer I discussion. Will paper. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's definitely continue thanks. this uh, after yeah. the after the the next yeah. speaker. So thanks once again, Carlo, for the excellent talk and a uh, virtual round of applause. <laughs> and uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Sagato uh, Bose, who's going to, who's from University College London. Hello. <clears throat> So let, let me uh, start by thanking all of you for coming here to attend our, our workshop, okay? And as a co-organizer, I should also uh, say that, uh, you know, Anupam has played the lion's share of the organization of this. So, so we are thankful, for, thankful to him and he and I. And uh, yeah, thanks for all of you to come to listen to us and participate in this. Okay? So, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, speak about uh, the, this experiment again in, in a bit more detail that, that Carlo highlighted in the first part of his talk on the quantum nature of gravity. And uh, again, uh, some part of it is going to have uh, a little bit uh, common, okay? So I'm going to tell about uh, the, you know, some, some of the implicit assumptions that we have and, and what are the, uh, obstacles during the implementation and, and actually why it is in general a fruitful effort. Okay? So I'm uh, largely going to concentrate, uh, the new things I'm going to tell are, are mostly on these last uh, three uh, kind of lines here, the, the relatively new works. I'm going to briefly allude to them. Okay? 
okay, aside aside discussing the, the background. Okay. Uh, now let me just go to full screen. Um, Right, so so I'm going to start a little bit with the the motivation. So first to uh, to show that what we are trying to do here, we are trying to find out the hidden quantum nature of an interaction we have known for very long, which is the Newtonian interaction. However, here by the Newtonian interaction, what we really mean is the the causal uh, causal Newtonian interaction, as as would appear in a low energy effective quantum field theory or it has also been discussed in context of uh, classical gravity as, as a limit of general relativity. So it's, a, it's an interaction of the same form and order as Newtonian interaction, but it's still causal, okay? And, and we are going to try to find out its quantum nature. Okay? And then I'm going to stress the assumptions which are inherent in, in concluding from the given experiment that gravity is uh, indeed quantum in nature. This will have some overlap with what Carlo has said, right? And then uh, I'm going to uh, speak about the orders of magnitudes in a, in a simple schematic of the experiment, okay? And, and how it combines our knowledge from quantum computation and quantum information, okay? I'm, I'm, little, I'm going to allude a little bit to the history and then I'm also going to briefly recap the, the experimental challenges that are on our way, okay? And, and also highlight why these may make incredible sensors. That is also related to the, the second part of Carlos' talk, for example. So why these are incredibly good sensors, I think we should talk about that. Now, uh, so of course, an important open question experimentally is whether gravity is quantum, right? And if you want to empirically check that by using uh, old quantum mechanics techniques, such as energy level quantization, or order of H bar corrections to potentials, as, as has been done in case of EM, that's very tough. Okay, that this is very extremely small. Okay, this is why we propose to take an alternative route, which is we are living post QI revolution. So let us try to use an aspect uh, which is closely related to superposition and entanglement. Okay, namely the entanglement conveying ability of this uh, interaction. Okay, and and use an effect which is the order of uh, you know the the Newtonian interaction, so that it's strong enough. Okay, to to get an effect. Okay, now as a backdrop, I would like to um, show this slide on how qubits are generally interacted in, in, in quantum computers. Okay, so a very popular way is you have two qubits and they are connected by a microwave bus. Okay, and, and in this microwave bus, you have virtual photon exchange. This is uh, so very recent papers from the Walraff group and earliest demonstrations were by Hiroshi in 1997 when he flew to atoms through an empty cavity and they got entangled by, you know, exchanging virtual photons through the cavity. Okay. And, but then on top of this, you should think that all EM interactions are like this. You don't need a cavity. A cavity only enhances the interaction, okay? But actually even in empty space, any electromagnetic interaction is through the exchange of uh, quantum. <clears throat> And, and this is exactly what we want to uh, test, or it's at least one way to see what we want to test is whether gravity uh, being still qualitatively in so many ways different from the other three forces, whether it is qualitatively similar to the other forces in this respect, okay? Whether the gravitational interaction happens due to the exchange of a quantum object, which is the Q here depicted here, or whether it is through the exchange of a classical. Object, okay? And this classical entity I have shown in the cartoon by this, uh, you know, with this uh, measuring, uh, you know, uh, apparatus here, because what is a classical system? A classical system is something which does not change during the act of the observation, okay? It remains in the same value. So this is why I depict classical entity in this way. Okay? Now, uh, what are the, uh, so, 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 so I'll, I'm going to make one, um, you know, assumption, okay, so, and, and one definition. So first of all, the definition is what we define as a classical field, okay, this we need to define first, because if we are going to show a non-classicality of the gravitational interaction, which uh, we, uh, so we should define at outset what is that we mean by classical field, okay, and 
this is our definition below here. What is a classical field? So we generally define a classical field as something which is yeah, showing here as in, in case of gravity, it's a curvature is that it has a specific value at every point in space time, okay? Uh, a number, okay? Or, or, or like 10 numbers, okay? But, but a number nonetheless at every point in space time, it can be correlated with states of quantum matter. So this J cat J bra are, are states of quantum matter, okay? So matter can be quantum, but they, they then you have some formula for computing the gravitational field from that matter that nonetheless gives you a classical output. Okay. This is our assumption here. And of course, the whole thing can have fluctuations itself, so it can be probabilistic. But as far as gravity is concerned, it will be a probabilistic statistical theory, a classical statistical theory, but can have quantum matters which you put in to get the classical gravity out. Okay, So that is the definition of a classical field. And the other thing is, uh, I say it's an assumption, but it's an assumption based from, from many experiments is that uh, the relativistic causality is valid. Okay, so all interactions in nature are causal, which means the interactions, in other words, in nature are are local in space time, or they can be a little bit smeared. That is fine, but they are local at the scales of separation of our experiment. Okay, so so huge amounts of non-locality in the physical interactions are not there. Okay, which means, of course, that only natural operations happening are local operations, okay? And the thing, other thing happening, which is uh, the communication, if gravity is classical, is a classical communication. Okay? So it is very easy to show under these two constraints, okay? So the local operation essentially stemming from this aspect of it, the relativistic causality, you can only have local operations, okay? And classical communication stemming from our assumption that the gravitational field is classical. If you have those two assumptions, this is called the LOCC paradigm in quantum information. So if you have this LOCC, it is very easy to prove that you cannot generate entanglement, okay? If you start from separable states, okay, you remain separable. An easy way to see this is when you do not have any probabilities involved, you have deterministic processes, then it's just unitaries evolving to quantum st states. So if they're initially a product, they remain a product. And you can generalize this slightly, okay, to uh, more general mixed states, but essentially you remain separable. Okay. So what we have established is that if you have a classical agent, uh, you a mediator, then you cannot establish entanglement. Okay. And of course, this has also been presented from slightly other uh, proofs and viewpoints by, say, Kaffrey and Taylor in 2013. And then also this paper by Krishnanda and others, this paper simultaneous with us by Mar Marletta and Vedral. And I should also mention that what you saw in Carlos' talk, his argument with uh, Marios. So all these in the end prove the same thing that a classical agent cannot entangle. Okay. So now, I, if you are, um, you know, um, if you have bought that, okay, I mean, this is, of course, uh, subject to debate and argument, we can, we can discuss that more. But now I proceed to the next part as to how exactly one would establish uh, entanglement, okay. And the schematics is as follows, you have two masses, you prepare one mass, M1, in superposition of L and R, you prepare another mass, in superposition of L and R. Okay, they are separated by this, this superposition size delta x, and their the centers are separated by a distance d. Okay, and you hold them parallel to each other for a while. Okay, now what is going to happen? Okay, so if you write that down, l plus r, l plus r, this is this four component superposition, but each component will have different rates of phase evolution. The rates will simply depend on the distance between these things, okay? So here I've taken just the Newtonian interaction between these two ages, these two masses, okay, for these two positions. Note down, of course, you must not forget that the neutron in interaction, as Carl also emphasized, is not direct action at a distance. And as I've said in the earlier part, it is through an agent, which is simply coming from relativistic causality, okay? So that agent is hidden in this form of expression. But nonetheless, we use this because this is the easiest way to calculate it, okay? So this is the effective final interaction that appears between two masses. And as you can see, it will be far stronger for the RL configuration for which the two masses are closest in comparison to the other three configurations. 
then there will be phase evolution. And as you can show, as you can see here clearly, this L plus R with that phase and this L plus R here with that other phase, these are not the same state. What does it mean? That these are not the same state means this cannot be factorized. And in fact, this is an entangled state. Okay, so you cannot pull out the state of one system. Okay. In fact, it can be maximally entangled under some conditions. Now, I am going to consider important limit where the R and L is much closer than any of the others. Okay, what does that mean? That means that the, the separation between the, the components of the separation between the apparatus, okay, is uh, uh, much smaller, separation between the closest components is much smaller than the, the splitting of the superposition. Okay, this is uh, a limit needed to understand the full strength of the effect I'm going to discuss. Okay, however, how close can you bring those masses for the R right uh, state of one mass and the left state of the other mass, okay, when they are closest enough, well, how close can you really get? For this, we have to see what is the main, uh, you know, um, the enemy which remains in the end, okay? So if you use neutral masses, if you neutralize all kinds of charge multiples inside, then in the end, you're still left with a kind of electromagnetic interaction, which is the Casimir interaction. So there will be induced dipoles, induced dipoles due to vacuum fluctuations, and they will interact, okay? Uh, interestingly, you can't do too much about that, okay? So they depend on things like density of mass, Planck's mass, okay, and, and just the distance. So, so in the end, if you want to make gravity about uh, 10 times the Casimir, you at least have to go to 200 microns of distance. Okay? However, we could do a little bit better using some screening, which I will not discuss in detail, but maybe Anupam will discuss in his talk later in the conference, okay? Um, now, uh, just an order of magnitude. So if you do have this limit where the, the superposition splitting left and right are so well separated that you only have to consider one phase, R and L, okay? If you have to consider only that phase, then if you take microspheres, micron size spheres, keep them the closest ones 200 microns apart, then as you can see in one second, this, this uh, you know, Newton's law essentially and Planck's law combined, okay? So E by H bar is the frequency is about a hertz. So you, in one second, you can entangle them and entangle them maximally, okay? And what I, I present this is here, the Planck's constant H bar being in the denominator is actually uh, circumventing the weakness, the usual perceived weakness of the capital G. Okay, and, and the masses are also playing a role. They are not that small as, as atoms or electrons. They are huge, they are microspheres, okay. Uh, unfortunately, a limit which people more often study, and, and I, I fully understand this is because of a realistic experimental uh, viewpoint that perhaps we will have the separations much smaller compared to the, separate, the distance between the two apparatus, okay. In this case, there's a huge damping factor multiplying this in, in the, in the effective entangling phase, okay? So one must strive to make a superposition which is larger than the closest approach of the masses. Then one can get an effect which is a much more prominent, okay? Otherwise, the number of runs will increase because the number of runs is inverse of the square of this uh, whole phase, okay? <clears throat> and, uh, right. So let us now go as a little bit allude to history. So indeed, Feynman suggested uh, in, in 1957 when he was posed with, with the question of uh, whether gravity is quantum and, and he was on the side of gravity being quantum. And what he said is, let's use a mass with the spin to move it one way or another. And then using that mass, let's try to move another mass with this gravitational effect one way or another. Okay. And then he said that so measurements on that have to be explained by quantum mechanical amplitudes, okay? So that was the extent of the remarks he made, okay? So what are we uh, doing on top of this? That's an important question. So first of all, if you literally want to use that kind of thing that to really move one mass, depending on mass centered in one place or the other, that's an incredibly slow effect, okay? Masses of our size cause 10 to the power minus 16 meter per second square acceleration. Okay, so you'll take a very long time to see any perceptible shift, 
Okay. Now, what aspect of the experiment was also still not uh, made perfectly clear in, in, in that discussion. So here we have realized that what you have to measure is the entanglement of the two masses. Okay. <clears throat> now, I, I just uh, point out a couple of things, which is, of course, our point of view. Okay. So is that things lesser than this, experiments lesser than this, like interferometry with a single mass, really does not go the full way because then you have to make an assumption that the gravitational field adjoined with the masses is also in a superposition midway, okay? And there's no way you can do an experiment to verify both in the same, same experiment. So in, in some sense, uh, you don't know whether gravity was involved at all if you do interferometry with a single mass, okay? And the other point is that if you are really able to prepare a superposition of uh, masses left and right, left and right with some splitting, then why not use two of them or of similar masses? Because this is a product of mass effect. So it is optimal to use two, two similar masses and, and, and do the two of them, okay? If you can do one, then doing two is not too much of a problem, okay? Uh, now, how do we, I will allude to how do we create such large mass, large splitting and long duration. That's also important. So one second is a pretty long duration, long duration superpositions, okay? So this is of course the main challenge that faces us at the moment. Now, uh, first of all, the simplest trick that one use and one, what has been used, for example, for macromolecules and things like that is you use something like a beam splitter, right? You, you split, yeah? All masses, go, all, all particles together going one way or an, another, okay? That does not easily generalize to masses as large as we are speaking about, mainly because of this tunneling formula, because what is a beam splitter? A beam splitter is nothing but uh, you know, a quantum barrier. And, and then you know you have a splitting left reflection and continuation. So that is incredibly difficult, especially depending on how much distance you want to split the thing. With, okay? So this is why we suggest you use an ancillary system. Okay? And in, in, uh, in, in short, we go back to Feynman's original proposal of using a stern garlock effect. Okay? Sorry, Sagato, uh, you have about five minutes left. Just Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, so um, so so from Ron Fulman's group, uh, spearheaded by EI Margaret, people have already done such experiments for atomic things, and we have calculated that this works well also for larger masses. So what you do is uh, you have a spin up and a spin down. They accelerate oppositely at appropriate times. They are flipped to give a break on their speeds. Then they come back, they speed up, they're flipped again to give a break and exactly come and recombine, okay? Under such situations, uh, you, you have a full interferometry and at the end, you can measure uh, relative phase between the spin components to complete your interferometry, okay? Now, this splitting is still uh, ongoing uh, investigations because there are some effects such as diamagnetism, which we uh, did not consider before. And what our, our net experience is now is that still there is no limit to how large superpositions you can create, but just there will be more time. You'll require more time to do it. So this is discussed, for example, in this paper with uh, Ryan recently, and it'll probably be discussed in his talk. Okay, and now how do we now? Now what we do is we use two such interferometers for our protocol, and what we do is we put an ad, ad just a, a extra stage at which we map the electronic spins to nuclear spins. So these do not see our external magnetic field so much, so the masses will just fall parallel with each other and have enough time to entangle. Okay. Now you can also repeat your calculation of this entanglement that I did before with masses with spins. So L, every L you replace with L up and every R you replace with R down. When you repeat the whole calculation, you will see at the end when the masses both come back, then the masses are disentangled because they have come back to the same position, they're in proxy. But the spins embedded in them become end up being entangled. So now you can purely measure a set of spin correlations to verify the entanglement of the masses due to the gravity, okay? So in the end of the experiment, you simply take the two objects to nanocrystals and measure the spin the correlation between their spins. And that is your signal for the entanglement. Okay? So I should now finish up and just quickly allude to the, the difficulties on the way. So one is of course the temperature because we do not want photon emission to reveal whether a mass is on the left or right. 
Another is the pressure because we do not want atomic kicks to reveal whether the mass is on the left or the right. And accordingly, we have to decrease temperature and pressure. Okay, so this pressure of exceedingly small values are needed in the per minus 16 Pascal, minus 15 Pascal. Okay. Now, another uh, nuisance is the uh, acceleration induced, noise induced by external masses randomly moving. And for this, we have recently suggested, this is a paper just come out by Marco Toros in physical research, and hopefully he will discuss in his talk, is that we place the whole thing in a freely falling box. So that automatically gets rid of all the external acceleration effects. Okay, so you have to do actually a drop tower with repeated drops, but the masses interacting with each other, they actually entangle, get entangled due to their curvature because this component is closer than that one, okay? So that effect still remains, yet all external, large external noise are canceled. However, there is still the curvature imposed by external masses and acceleration induced by random kicks to the box outside, depending how good your vacuum is. So those can all be ameliorated, yeah? That's what we have found out, okay? And last but not the least, I want to mention that the same technology, I won't go into detail, are are when you develop, it's not just we are waiting for a yes, no answer, okay? Carlo also told that you can get more answer about the discreteness of time, but also on the way we can be incredibly good sensors. So depending on how much size you reach, first you have an incredibly good sensor for the, the H00 component, like the Newtonian component. Then you, larger supervision, have better sensors for the V by C effect, so the frame dragging things. Then you have, when you go really to meter scale superpositions, but of nano objects, not of micro objects, then you can actually start detecting gravitational waves, okay? And this is actually in a low frequency regime. So it's in the same regime as LISA, you know, complementary to LIGO, okay? Uh, so that is uh, what I would have liked to tell. I mean, I could go into more detail of the, the sensor part if anyone wishes, but uh, these are more or less what we have done uh, together, I have spoken and alluded to these things in the red uh, in, in this uh, talk. We have also found that Q dips can sometimes help instead of spins with two states, okay? And recently, an atomic experiment was also published by Yair Margalit and Ron Polman, and, and we, we were co-authors in this uh, science advances. Okay? Uh, yeah, so, so I can um, stop here and, and take questions. Okay, thanks for that very exciting talk. Um, so let's see, are there questions? I, I don't see any in the chat window at the moment, but let me just see if people have hands raised. It looks like, uh, so Nancy, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks about though, for that talk. Um, I just have a very quick question about the separation, the 200 microns, was that between the centers or was that between the edges of the particles? No, it will be the edges. So it's the closest approach they can do. Uh, in, in fact, long ago, we were uh, kind of almost writing up the paper with a much smaller approach, like, uh, you know, hundreds of nanometers, because that's what my other experimental colleagues were telling me. And then we were in a conference and Andy raised the hand and told, well, you cannot do better than 100. And then when calculated came out to be 200, actually. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so this is this is without screening. We have seen that with screening, you can approach 10 microns. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a uh, yeah this is a problem, um, and and um, yeah. So there's a limitation on the closest approach, which means indirectly a limitation on the the amount of superposition. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So um, since it doesn't look like there's other hands, I have a quick question for you, Sagato. So I think it's really exciting the prospects for um, potentially. Uh, gravitational waves at lower frequencies closer to the LISA band or below the LIGO band. So there's also been a lot of proposals for atom interferometer based gravitational detectors. And I wondered if you just would comment about how the sensitivity would compare with these larger particles versus the atom interferometers, if that's something right. that you've thought about. Right, right. So these are exactly in the same range as atomic interferometers because they are based on the same principle. We just have uh, very large atoms replacing them. However, the sensitivity is a product of m times delta x here. Yeah. So kind of there's a m outside. Yeah. And and delta x appears from differences in h zero zero and things like that. So what happens is this m delta x product you can have very high here because of the large mass. If you can make 
maintain the same delta x as in atoms. Because for atoms, we know you can have meter scale superpositions. On top of that, if we could make these much larger, obviously that requires a much more splitting force, a strong splitting force, then, then you can achieve this uh, sensitivity. So it's like a noon state of 10 to the power 13 atoms, um, or not less than that, minus seven. So 11, 10 to the power 10 atoms going one way or other. But of course, the challenge is this uh, massive, uh, you know, meter scale superposition. So it, it is compared to atomic sense that if we were able to send clumps of 10 to the power 10 atoms uh, going all one way or other, yeah, which doesn't happen in the normal BC interferometers, so each atom is splitting and going both ways. So, so that would be then be equivalent. Um, Thanks. Okay, looks like one more question from Marcus. Thanks, uh, Zubato. It's always a beautiful talk. Um, I'm following up on a question that we discussed on the phone some time ago, and since we <laughs> haven't had the chance to, no, no. to continue yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> um, and namely, the question is, um, do you know, have you thought about what happens when your initial state is not in a pure state? Right. Uh, initial state is not in a pure state. Um, uh, we we have uh, we always uh, have started from a yeah, unfortunately till now we have always started from a pure state. We included going to mixed states due to the decoherence on the way. Right. Um, ah, you are you are talking about like a thermal state possibly, right? Uh, well, yeah. does it say some some non-unit uh, purity? Uh, exactly. SD. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think. Uh, so our our sensing, like the sensing we are saying here, is is fine for thermal states because just like in atomic yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, part yes, anywhere, yes. unfortunately, the the gravity mediated entanglement depends on the distance. So so there, I think uh, cooling them to a pure enough state is is very essential. Okay. Mm. Uh, and and uh, like the kinds of cooling you have achieved are 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 very important already. Now whether we need to go down much further in cooling or not, uh, I, I think we did an initial estimate in the first paper. And I, I think it's not that you need absolute pure state. So there's a, enough of a fluctuation. So essentially that, that has to be much, much less than uh, delta X mm -hmm. and much, much less than D. So one can estimate. So it's, it's, it, it, it will not be like zero temperature, but, but it might be a few orders uh, below the temperatures which have been achieved in your lab. So, so we, uh, we are, I can recompute this to check. Um, but it, it, it is not, it is uh, not, uh, I can only say that it is not ridiculously below the temperatures you have uh, achieved. Okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In that, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the destabilizing the gravitational phase. Right, right. But there's another effect which we did not notice before, and, and Ron told us is, is bringing the thing back to overlap, and your um, your, mm -hmm. your uncertainty is there. That might require a bit more of cooling. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, uh, yeah, Yair probably will com comment on that in his talk. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Sugato. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. So with that, maybe we should move on to the last uh, talk of the morning session. Uh, so thanks again, uh, Sugatu, for our excellent uh, talk. Another virtual round of applause. <laughs> and uh, let's uh, move on to uh, Samir Mather from Ohio State University. Okay, so I'll try to share screen. Okay, so can people see the shared screen? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to talk at this nice conference. Uh, I work on the black hole information paradox and string theory and things like that, which may not be the focus of interest for many of you here. So what I thought I would do is talk in very general terms to just talk about what is the information paradox and what is going on with the paradox and where I think the status of everything is today. So I'll just, this is the outline. I'll just give you a brief review of what the information paradox is. Then I'll go through something called a small corrections theorem, which makes this paradox into a very precise question. There's a precise contradiction, which the paradox is pointing out. I'll then tell you how I think the paradox is resolved, at least in strict theory. It is by something called the first ball paradigm. But then there are other approaches in string theory, which I will lump under, under the name the wormhole paradigm, 
uh, which is what's going on if you hear the, these days when you hear the word islands or wormholes, things like that. I don't actually believe that's correct. So I will also tell you what I think are the difficulties with that. And then perhaps say a little bit about why I think people are going in that direction, which I think is a little puzzling, but at least let's try to see what is motivating people to think about wormholes. Okay, so let's first start about with the black hole information paradox itself. And the idea of the paradox really start from something very simple, and that's the fact that gravity is an attractive force. So if you have a big mass capital M here and a test mass little m here at a distance r, then what should I call the mass, the energy of the test mass little m? So by itself, it has some energy mc square, but then when it's placed near the big mass, there's a negative gravitational potential and the negative sign here is what comes from the fact that gravity is attractive. And then you find that if you make r sufficiently small, smaller than this value, the net energy of this test mass little m uh, is negative. Now you might say you want to do this properly with general relativity and so on, but that only adds a factor of two. So once you are closer than this radius, which is the radius of the horizon for a black hole of mass m, then inside that, you can have particles whose net energy as seen from infinity is negative. And that of course makes the vacuum of the quantum theory unstable because now you can create pairs of particles. One particle is inside this horizon region with negative energy, one is outside with positive energy and the wave function can just uh, move to that situation. The outside particle just floats off to infinity and that's called Hawking radiation and the inside particle lowers the mass of the black hole are conserving the energy of the entire system. Now, the important thing is that these two particles we produce by this uh, process are actually in an entangled state. And the entanglement can come from many places. For example, this could be an electron, this could be a positron or other way around. And so typically you would produce a linear combination of the two possibilities. If they, if they have spins, it could be you know, up, down, minus, down, up. Typically they are produced in a singlet state. Or even if they are spinless particles, just the existence of a particle here and no particle here, like no particles being created at a given time or actually having a pair there. So that's one and one. Uh, that's also a source of entanglement. So it doesn't much matter what kind of entanglement it is. You can just schematically model it by some kind of an entangled state. And we'll just take this as a toy model for entanglement. And with this, the entanglement will be between the inside and the outside particle is as you can see log two. So as you produce more particles, the entanglement between the entire radiation sitting at infinity and the particles which are inside the black hole, that keeps rising. So after two particles, the outside particles called B1, inside particles C1, so that's one entangled pair. And then you have B2 and C2, so that's another entangled pair. And so after N pairs are emitted, you have a small hole left. Uh, here are the inside members, those are the outside radiation members, and the entanglement after N pairs is N log two. So it's just keeping on growing. And so the question is, what happens at the end point of the evaporation? And so now there are two possibilities. Hawking in 75 said, well, let the black hole evaporate away completely. And then you have all this radiation here and it's in an entangled state, but there is nothing it's entangled with because that stuff is gone. So then this radiation cannot be described by any quantum state, only by a density matrix. Now, of course you have started the whole process, maybe with the star which collapsed, made the black hole, and the black hole evaporated, you started the whole thing with some pure state psi i of the star. And in the end, you have this radiation, which can only be described by a density matrix. So in fact, that violates the unitarity of quantum mechanics, where a pure state must evolve to a pure state. So that's the unitarity puzzle of the information loss puzzle. And so this is the original version of the information paradox. So of course, people try to save this by saying that, well, we don't actually want to have loss of quantum unitarity. So perhaps the evaporation stops by some uh, means we don't completely understand, but when the black hole gets down to the Planck size. So then you have these Planck scale things called remnants, and they still have this large entanglement of N log two uh, with the black hole, with the radiation. And the N is of the order of the mass of the black hole you started with upon Planck mass, a whole square. So that's a arbitrarily big number. Now that's not a very satisfactory solution because even though you uh, don't have any information loss or loss of unitarity here, you need an infinite number of states in these Planck side remnants because you could have started with a black hole, which was arbitrarily big. And so the question just gets transferred to one of saying, how do you fit so many states? In fact, an arbitrary large number of states 
inside an arbitrary small volume with an uh, you know with inside a blank volume with just blank energy. So there are a lot of difficulties in trying to make a model of gravity where such a thing would be possible. So what we have seen so far is that you know once you have this Hawking process, which automatically happens because gravity has negative in, uh, a negative sign in it, attractive, the potential is negative, then the vacuum is automatically unstable and you're going to produce these pairs. And it doesn't matter what happens at the end point of evaporation, you get into trouble either way. Like if you evaporate away completely, you have this lack of unitarity, you stop with a remnant, then you, know, you have troubles from there as well. And so this situation is known as the black hole information paradox. Okay, so then you might wonder that this looks very strange, but we have been talking in very rough uh, terms. So perhaps there are some delicate corrections here or there, which will resolve the puzzle. We haven't thought very much about the details of this process. And so it might be that right now, people keep like, like draw this graph these days that the emission, as the emission proceeds, the entanglement is keeping on going up. We said after n steps, it's n log two. So that's what we call the page curve. And that's just going up. Just notice this is different from the behavior of a normal body. Like when a piece of coal burns, uh, there's an atom in here, maybe it emits a photon. Typically that also creates an entanglement because the, you know, the photon may come out as spin up, leaving the atom and spin down, but the photon may be spin down, leaving the atom and spin up. So they are entangled with each other. So in the beginning, even for a normal body, the entanglement of the radiation with the remaining coal does keep rising. But after a while, this atom inside the coal will also float out to infinity like ash because you want all the coal to go to be left with nothing to model the complete evaporation of the black hole. But then in the end, you'll find this photon is entangled with this atom, this photon with this atom. So whatever is in the radiation zone is not entangled with anything else just with itself. It's in a pure state. So after around the halfway point, the entanglement starts coming down and then it goes to zero. So that's how normal bodies behave. And that's called the normal page curve. The whole problem is a black hole is doing this instead. So then people started wondering that maybe Hawking's computation was too rough. We I mean, did a leading order calculation, uh, just modeling it by you know just entangled pair after pair, but there could be small corrections which delicately hide some entanglement between all these very large number of particles that are coming out. And then maybe it's okay. The whole entanglement at the end might uh, be actually going to zero. So for example, you could model that by saying that instead of taking Hawking's, Hawking's entangled state, you could add a little bit of let's say the orthogonal state and this small correction could come from some quantum gravity effect that we don't know. And the correction to each emitted pair might be small, but as we saw, you're going to emit a very, very large number of particles at the end. And if there are these delicate corrections to each one, then maybe it invalidates the argument. So here's a concrete uh, illustration of that. Suppose at the first step you do what Hawking said, but at the next step, suppose in the first step there was no emission, then you have one kind of correction with a model by epsilon one for the second pair. And if at the first step you had did have a pair created, then you model it by a different kind of correction at the second step. So now you can see each pair is being entangled with each of the previous pairs. And so there are, in fact, after n steps, you can see there are two to the n correction terms. And so that made people think that, you know, if each term correction term is very small, even exponentially small in n, because the number of correction terms which, which appear to be Hawking leading order calculation is exponential in n, it's going like two to the n. Maybe in the end, the entanglement does come down once you take into account the subleading corrections. And in that case, of course, there was really no puzzle because the leading order entanglements, which are drawn by the thick line, they were causing Hawking's puzzle. And perhaps these small uh, subleading entanglements between all the other particles are making the actual curve go down to zero uh, at the end point of evaporation. And at that point, the black hole can just disappear and then there is no puzzle. So the question is whether rising curve can be corrected by small corrections to become a curve that's coming down. But in fact, there is a theorem that actually proves that that does not happen. So if the, all the corrections are bounded at each step, that is, you still have the normal black hole to leading order, at the end of when you re it reaches Planck scale, it doesn't matter. For, for the most of the evaporation process, while the hole is big compared to the Planck size, suppose the corrections are all bounded by some epsilon, then in fact, the entanglement at step n must actually keep growing. So S at n plus one uh, increases by log two, and the reduction because of small corrections can be at most two epsilon, where epsilon is the bound on all the epsilon case. So somehow the corrections to each particular pair, they can be there. There'll always be some small corrections from coming from some unknown quantum gravity effect for each pair, but these corrections cannot accumulate over a very large number of pairs. So if you emit n particles and epsilon is small, one might roughly think if epsilon times n is order one, maybe that could the corrections could solve your problem. But this says no, there is no n in this uh, uh, expression. If each epsilon is small, the entanglement actually keep growing and you can't solve the puzzle. 
So that makes the black hole uh, uh, puzzle, the Hawking's puzzle of 1975, which was like an argument, this makes it to a, like a rigorous thing you have to worry about. And you can characterize the situation in, in this way. If the physics around the horizon is like the physics of the vacuum, like this room to leading order, we like to think the horizon is a normal place. But if to some leading order, there can always be small corrections, the physics of the horizon is actually like the physics of this room. And there's one more assumption in the actual theorem, which says that once a particle leaves the region of the black hole, like goes past 4m, 6m, some distance you want to think about, is gone, it can't be changed anymore. Okay, it's not going to change once it leaves, which is how you know, if you burn a piece of coal, once the photon goes a meter away from the coal, it's not going to change anymore. So let's assume that as well. Then in fact, there is no solution to the information loss. So the entanglement will actually keep growing. Uh, you could at most load it by two epsilons. So that's the dotted line. Small corrections can do that much for you, but they can't, they make the entanglement come down. And so when the black hole evaporates, you will have the problem that we were talking about. Okay, so what is the solution to that person? A lot of people have worked on what we call the fuzzball paradigm. Try to list some of the names here of the people who have written papers on this. So in string theory, what, when you have to make a black hole, you have to take, make the black hole out of what is present in the theory, and those are strings and brains and so on. So you take a collection of strings and brains and you make a bound state of them to gather some mass into one place, and you think, okay, have I made a black hole? So you might think that at weak coupling, when you take strings and brains, we know how to play with them. That's just weak coupling string theory. We work with it all the time. But you know, once you turn on the coupling to a big value, it's a unified theory, so you turn on the gravitational coupling also, then you might would expect that there should be a black hole horizon forming around this big mass you have placed. Suppose you take a million brains, then at weak coupling, it might be a Planck-sized uh, cluster, but at uh, strong coupling, you might expect a big horizon of a you know, few kilometers uh, being developed around this cluster. But it turns out that's not what happens. If you estimate the size of a bound state made of strings and brains, the size of the bound state, I've just called it B here, it actually grows with the number of brains uh, in the bound state. It also grows with the coupling. So in fact, the number of brains in the bound state for what is called a strominger waffa black hole, if you try to compute that black hole and try to find the state size of these bound states, you find that the, it grows with the coupling. The coupling is called G. So there's some parameters telling you how you compactify the extra dimension. It grows with the number of brains. There are three kinds of brains here labeled by these different ends. And it grows in a certain way. And what's very interesting is it grows exactly at the same rate at which you would uh, find the horizon of this black hole with that much mass and charges to be growing. So what we are saying here is that when you try to estimate the size of a bound state in string theory, the size of the bound state is always the same order as the radius of a black hole horizon made with the same masses and charges. So that gave rise to the idea that maybe in string theory, you never actually form a black hole. And so then people went back and looked at the actual details of what you get in the gravity picture. Like you go and see what are the gravitational solutions being generated by a collection of strings and brains. And you find what is happening is as you approach the region where the horizon would have been, the extra dimensions, the compact dimensions, they are no longer trivially tensored with the non-compact dimensions, but they are small, they are Planck scale and the horizon could be, let's say three kilometers, but still what happens around the horizon scale is that the compact dimension is no longer trivially factored with non-compact ones and all the different structures you can make this way, they give you the different microstates of the black hole. So the fact that you can actually have non-trivial uh, structure on the size of this, uh, there may be some interesting connections to the stuff that Anupam and others have been doing with high derivative gravity where they also get these you know, big ball shaped objects. And I'm very interested in you know, exploring those connections. But anyway, here what you find with these first balls is that around the horizon, normally you had something close to the vacuum. And now you have something which is very far from the vacuum. Overlap in the vacuum is pretty much zero. And so you don't get the normal pair creation. This guy radiates from his surface like a normal body. And in fact, this whole page curve comes down like a normal body and the puzzle is over. So, so many cases of this have been done in string theory now that I don't think there's any room for people to say that, you know, with some combination of strings and brains, you can actually make a normal horizon. Every single case that people have tried over the last, this is roughly 23 year old story, uh, in every single case people have tried, you actually, instead of getting a horizon, you get a, get a first ball. So you'd say the puzzle is over. And so then you would ask, why are people still worrying about the information paradox? And the story then what people are worrying about as an alternative to fuzzballs, I'll lump it under the category of the wormhole paradigm because some of the initial papers called it the wormhole idea. And it comes from the following scenario, which is very tempting to think about, but as I will come back and tell you, it doesn't quite work till you do something serious in your, change something serious in your assumptions. So let's start to take a look at what people were initially trying to do. 
So they said, okay, we know that the black hole has a smooth horizon. It's like a vacuum around the horizon. All the non-trivial stuff is at the singularity. Then the information puzzle can't be solved. So let's not worry about that. Let's say the exact description of the black hole is something very complicated, something very quantum gravitational uh, in the entire region of two units, say even four m. Some, something is happening there and we won't try to specify what mess is going on there. All we assume is that the entire physics is a unitary evolution of some quantum gravity. But we will also assume that far from the hole, everything is normal. Okay? Once you go past, let's say 100M, just have normal flat space string theory, which we have all solved in the standard string theory textbooks. But we'll now make the crucial assumption that out of these complicated degrees of freedom, you can extract some linear combinations of these complicated variables, which behave like ordinary semi-classical gravity. So, you know, the actual quantum gravity is very complicated there. There should be some kind of semi-classical description so that we can have some trust in the kind of picture of the black hole that we had developed uh, in, uh, our semi in our classical intuition or semi-classical intuition. So some effective combination of these degrees of freedom are these semi-classical wave packets, which can be described by a scalar field, satisfying, let's say, box phi equals zero. And this is only in the wavelengths between, let's say, one Fermi and three kilometers. Nothing to do with the Planck scale, but what's called low energy effective uh, semi-classical physics somehow comes out as some complicated approximate map from these exact degrees of freedom. Then what will happen? So you will actually still get an evolution. You will actually, these pairs will uh, come out in the end once things go past 100 M, their physics is normal. So they will all become ordinary gravitons. So that's the exact story. And the approximate story, you will get these you know, entangled uh, and effective infalling member of the pair here and outgoing member of the pair, the outgoing member become these gravitons. And so now you, it's good because the exact theory is this and the semi-classical theory uh, does reproduce some kind of physics which Hawking was seeing, but that's only an approximation. Well, if things were like, like this, then you know everybody would be sort of right because there is a complicated quantum gravity that we still have to know why the gravity made this whole black hole so messy. We thought the quantum gravity should be only at a singularity, but we are saying for reasons we don't know, the quantum gravity is all over, but the semi-classical picture is also there. Okay, but it turns out that this doesn't work because if you apply the small correction theorem to this setting, you find that the entanglement still keeps growing. And that's because we said this, this approximation tells you that at least approximately you can make these pairs which are being created. And then if you just put all these small episodes into these approximations, you find the entanglement is growing. Okay, so then that doesn't work out. So let's see if we can still fix it. We still want to keep the semi-classical approximation to be valid in this region because suppose we love that semi-classical approximation. So what else can we change in the theorem? Well, what we can change is, let's say that physics is not local. Suppose there can be little wormholes that can connect the dynamics inside this quantum gravity region and the dynamics which is all the way where the radiation is, arbitrarily far away. So it's like a wormhole which might connect this space to this space. Doesn't matter how far the gravitas go, this connection is always there. Now, if you start tampering with these radiated particles, even after they have gone arbitrarily far from the hole, the small correction theorem has nothing to say. Because in principle, you could always emit an entangled pair, and then the guy which is inside, that was the whole problem. This guy was entangled with something here. This guy can just tunnel out through the wormhole, and then both guys are infinite. So then there would be no puzzle. So the semi-classical, the small correction theorem can't say anything about that. So now you're in this funny situation where you have these wormholes. Okay. So, now, so what we're seeing here, just to summarize what I said so far, the small correction theorem just leaves you with two sharply different possibilities. So the first one paradigm, you just have a mess. There's no semi-classical approximation to this, at least as far as the Hawking radiation stuff is concerned. And then it just emits stuff like a piece of coal, stuff goes up. There's no semi-classical approximation. And I think that solves the puzzle. That's all you can get from string theory. What's interesting about the fuzzball paradigm is that when you look into string theory, you actually get this quantum stuff. And the fuzzball people are actually making the fact, making these states one by one, and they're showing you that in fact the semi-classical approximation is gone, but you can't actually get it back. And the one more paradigm, you say we are not actually trying to go see what's wrong with the semi-classical approximation. Let's just assume that somebody can make some kind of a mess here, which is not the semi-classical approximation. But whatever that mess is, we still want a semi-classical approximation of the entangled pairs to be coming out in some approximation. So you can see I put the plus order epsilon with that approximation. We still want this to come out of this mess. And then the exact theory must have the non-local effects. So there we go ahead and add that. So it's the, it's the argument between these two paradigms which is going on these days. What you can't have is that you can't have physics which is normal like this without wormholes and also get a semi-classical approximation. People would love to have this 
and this, because then they could be happy with their semi-classical intuition and also you know, solve the puzzle. But if you don't put non-local effects, small correction theorem tells you, you can't have this beauty of the semi-classical approximation. Okay, so this is, what, this is what we have actually learned so far and the two approaches that people are arguing about. But then you might say this whole wormhole thing looks so strange. I mean, who would like to have these non-local wormholes? We don't have, have any direct evidence for them in string theory. I mean, nobody's actually constructed a wormhole. And we've done so many calculations. In string Sorry to interrupt, uh, Smirch, I have about five, five minutes left. Just Thank you. So we have done so many calculations in string theory and you know, we've never seen a wormhole uh, directly in you know, connecting one point to a faraway point. So why should we be pursuing this direction? Why don't we just say the whole thing in black holes, in string theory, black holes, just these fuzzballs and we are, we are done. The paradox has been over for quite a while. So why are some people pursuing this idea? Why are people trying to look for these wormholes? Why are they pursuing the idea? And the reason actually seems to go back to something uh, to some intuition, they are trying to derive from ads CFT duality, which works very well in string theory. But after telling you what this idea is that they are trying to extract from ads CFT duality, I will also argue that the idea they're trying to extract from there is not correct. The extension they are making, I think, is incorrect, and we should not be going in the wormhole direction. So what does ads CFT duality by itself tell us? It tells you that for the same dynamics, you can have two equivalent descriptions. Suppose you take a stack of D brains, just like some kind of extended objects in like strings, but they're sheets in string theory. And they're just sitting there somewhere in space. They create some little curvature space around them. So I've just drawn that like this, but just some you know, 1000 brains, you, you know, buy them in the market, stack them on your table. That's all this is. And then you throw a graviton on it. And so the graviton goes and hits the D brains. And when it hits the D brains, it creates excitations there. It excites the D brains. That's given by some collection of open strings between the D brains. You don't have to worry about that. It's just some particular mess some excitation on this D-brain, and that these excitations, excitations are described by Yang-Mills theory or gauge theory. And then this excitation sort of spread, they become more complicated and spread over a larger region. So that's the dynamics. The graviton goes there, it excites the D-brains where it hits, and then the excitation region, it spreads and spreads and spreads, and that's all described by Yang-Mills theory. But, but there's an alternate description where this graviton comes, there are no D-brains to be seen anywhere, all you see is smooth space. And the entire spreading here, it just, uh, maps to the same graviton going deeper and deeper and deeper into ADS space. And so there's a one-to-one -one map between the dynamic scene of this spreading ball of yang mills excitations here and this graviton going deeper and deeper here. And there's a one-to-one -one map between everything. And that's what we call ADS CFT duality. So what's amazing is something you know, looks very complicated in this language, looks very simple in this language. And again, things which look complicated here might look simple there. So then you might wonder because of that, that could there be two descriptions of the black hole, like one which is very complicated like this, and one effective description, which is simple, where you get your semi-classical physics. So it sort of looks appealing because then you could get back your semi-classical physics also. And you know, in ads CFT, we already saw that there could be complicated, that could be simple. So maybe it's just like some very complicated combination of these variables are these variables. And, but the small correction theorem tells you, you can't have that unless you have the non-local effects. So what's wrong with wanting this? It looks like a logical thing to want. And what's wrong with that is that if you actually go back and see what happened in this case, how come you could replace these deep brain physics with this very simple ADS space with gravity? The point is the D3 brain state, when you stack a lot of D3 brains together, it is the number of D3 brains was a million. The bound state is unique. There's only one state. So it has no entropy, S equals zero. And so you can represent it by a, a, a different uh, behavior, the ADS metric, but ADS metric also has no entropy. There's just one metric there. So this one ground state of the deep brains is replaced by the one state of this metric. And that's why you could represent it like that. But it doesn't work for a black hole because the black hole has entropy. In fact, the whole surface of a black hole is defined by how much entropy it creates. And so there are a lot of different states inside the black hole. You can't actually map them by one state, which is basically like the vacuum and start playing with the vacuum. You have to stay with first balls because different first balls give you the e to the s different orthogonal states, you can't map them to just one state. So it's very paradoxical that you would have loved the idea of this holography or whatever you think of it, ADS CFT. The idea is originated with the idea of the black hole and the you know, area of the black hole giving the surface. But if you try to apply the holography very seriously to the black hole, you run into this puzzle, you can't replace e to the s different states by one state, the vacuum. And in fact, you shouldn't try to do that. So, so that's my summary of everything. This is my last slide over here. 
the uh, Hawkins information paradox can be made into a very precise puzzle using the small corrections theorem. And the, that tells you that either the horizon is not a vacuum region, so then you just have a fuzz watch like a piece of coal. And then your hard work is to show that in your theory of gravity, you don't get the semi-classical physics where everything goes to a center and you're left to the vacuum near the horizon. That's the no-hair theorem, like you can't get out of it. But in string theory, you find that doesn't happen. You get these coal-like objects, these big, big fuzz balls. And I believe that's the correct answer. There's no vacuum, just radiates like a piece of coal. Or you're left with this wormhole paradigm where you say there's some quantum, complicated quantum gravity, and I do want my semi-classical approximation to still be there, then you are forced to these non-local effects and you can't get out of them, but you say, I live with that and try to explore what's going on. So that's the debate going on between the whole wormhole or islands or those kinds of games here. And what I believe is the correct answer, the possible uh, game where people are constructing these states in, in string theory. And it will be very interesting to see uh, how this thing develops. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Samir, for the nice talk. I, we have a hand raised from uh, Carlo. Um, hi, Samir, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, this discussion is relevant for the um, Gravity Lab uh, uh, experiments, but uh, <clears throat> let me uh, make a small comment to what, to what you said from my perspective. I, I, I do agree with your uh, uh, criticism of the uh, uh, assumption uh, of uh, ADF CFT uh, for very much the reason you, you you say, and I, I do find this your uh, fuzzball uh, paradigm uh, interesting and uh, um, uh, and worthwhile looking at. Uh, however, I do not agree with your uh, formulation of the problem, which is a common formulation of the problem, uh, because you, you you correctly say that there are two uh, two options, and uh, uh, you correctly say that the second is remnants, but the, then you discard um, quite easily, like many people do. Uh, the remnant possibility on the basis of an argument, the various argument, you gave the, the, the simplest one, uh, which is that uh, a remnant uh, uh, should have uh, uh, too many uh, state, possible states in a, uh, a small, uh, in a small object. Um, and the way you formulate it is uh, in a small volume. Um, this, of course, I, I imagine you would agree, it's, it's wrong in general relativity because inside a small, uh, 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 horizon, a small sphere that can be an arbitrary large uh, volume, a very large volume with, uh, with many possible states. And I think that um, this is what, uh, this sort of misunderstanding is what has created uh, the fake um, information paradox. Uh, in, in, in loop quantum gravity, uh, at the end, you correctly formulate the problem, what happened at the end of the evaporation. I think that's the right formulation. At the end of the evaporation, loop quantum gravity, you make, a, if you have a small um, horizon, you make a transition to a white hole, which has a large inside with all possible states and which has a long long life and which very slowly the information comes, uh, uh, comes about. So I just wanted to, um, th this is a long discussion, maybe not that, the place to, to do it, but I want to sort of, for the records, uh, say that uh, uh, there is a possibility in which nothing funny happens, uh, there's no violation of anything that you expect from standard quantum field theory or anything like that, or generativity before uh, the final transition. There's a long living remnants um, with a lot of quantum states in a small, uh, inside a small uh, surface. The number, the black hole entropy does not limit the, the number of states inside. Um, and, uh, and, and and this is another possibility. So I absolutely agree. And in fact, in fact, if I had a, my, in my longer version of the talk, which would not be in a half hour talk, I actually do have pictures where I write down that the this remnant here, the typical model for that, that one would use if one wanted to go the remnant route is that of a baby universe where you have a plank sized neck, but inside you just open up into a big you know, baby universe or a, a bag of gold as it is called. and uh, that could hold an arbitrary amount of entropy. So I didn't actually go into details of that. I think the reason that, so, and I think many people who work with GR or loop quantum gravity would actually take that route. And in principle, that is not ruled out. I absolutely agree with that. Okay? I think the reason I sometimes worry about it and I'm not so comfortable with that coming from string theory is that as you well know, that if you try to make a narrow neck and then open up into a bubble, you need a violation of the null energy condition uh, somewhere at the neck, because once something is focusing in, it can't again open out 
if the, all the normal positivity conditions are preserved. It's not an ultimate problem because over very small regions, uh, you can certainly violate the positivity conditions and energy momentum by Casimir energy, for example, which is negative. So yeah. you can imagine making these uh, bags of gold or baby universes, and in principle, that can be an answer. It goes along with, of course, the idea that the area of something is no longer telling you how much entropy there is in it because you right. can now store the arbitrary amount of entropy. So the area only tells you how rapidly you can exchange entropy with the interior and A exactly. by is not the entropy anymore. Exactly. But what has happened is that in string theory, we have somehow gone away from that view. And that's largely because of the stromager waffa calculation of 1996, where we actually of computed course. at least for extremal holes and then later for near extremal holes, the actual number of states uh, and we found it to match the area. So I think, and also in string theory, when we try to make these states, because they always puff up and give us these fuzz balls, for very simple black holes, what are called two-charge extremal holes, we've actually made all the states. And we know there are no more. And we know they are all fuzz balls. Right. And so in that sense, because we have actually started from the other side, from exact string theory, and been able to see what we get, we can count the states, make them, see their wave functions, do everything, and we find they are fuzz balls. That's right. why we somehow have gone away from the idea that there could be these very interesting things which by itself can happen because gravity has negative energy. And so inside with space time can do so many interesting things. Right. And uh, we haven't seen that in string theory. And it's, it's the same thing I was saying about wormholes. We haven't seen the wormholes in string theory. The simplest black holes we can solve completely. And they're all fuzzballs. And so that's why I'm very hesitant to go the wormhole route also, because since I'm right now just focusing on string theory, uh, those things don't come up. I, I agree. I completely agree. But uh, to some extent, the problem is caused by string theory, not by nature. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. If you don't want to take string theory, it's very important, I should say, you cannot make fuzz balls. It's the extra dimensions that I have and the extended objects in the theory which allow the fuzz balls to exist. The moment you take away any of those, like if you give me three plus one canonically quantized gravity, I will not get a fuzz ball. Thank you. I will have to end up with a remnant or an emission. Absolutely. So Great, then let's take a question from uh, Sugato and then after that we'll transition into our uh, broader discussion. Uh, but go ahead, Sugato. Uh, I was just uh, wondering whether, so uh, where the horizon is now uh, replaced uh, by a region, so is there a strongly fluctuating space-time now in the horizon region? I mean, how, how strongly is it fluctuating the space-time? Yes, so the, the space-time there is completely messed up. Ultimately, everything has to be at the Planck scale because, in fact, the entropy here is the given by the area. And as you know very well, the entropy is equal to one bit per Planck area. So it's completely messed up. So it's, it's, you can ask, how do we ever make these things? And how do we know this is what you get? Because Planck scale physics is difficult to work with, even with string theory. But what happens is that we already know how to count all the states in string theory one by one. And then what happens, you start with the simplest ones where you, know, you just have stuff like Planck scale little things bubbles around, you have like just two or three structures, which are big. And you can make go to the case where you have 10, 10 of these little bubbles I've drawn there, 100 bubbles. And you will take the li limit of them, you find them there, Planck separated, it's all very messy. But you can see the entire limit coming out. And so you start with the simplest ones and you can make them explicitly. So what this picture is supposed to represent is that what happens is that what happens in this region is something like a bubble of nothing. So that's a new kind of topology. So if you imagine making a bubble of nothing, then you, you find that the extra dimensions are not trivially tensored with the uh, non-compact dimension. The extra dimension has pinched off, but completely smoothly. So if you imagine making lots of little bubbles of nothing in some region, then they are joined to each other with other topological spheres which can carry fluxes. That's the nature of these structures. So simplest one would just have a couple of them, one bubble of nothing, you can make two, you can make four, you can place them Planck distance, and then you get all the states. You can prove that all the states are here. So in fact, instead of bubbles of nothing, you get what are called kaluza klein monopoles. And at that point, this is exact. This is what you actually end up getting. kaluza klein monopoles and anti-monopoles. That's how you mix the compact dimension with the non-compact. So you take a limit towards where they come to the generic one. And that does have all Planck scale structure with Planck with order one fluctuations in the limit. Okay, okay, thank you. So the fluctuations are Planck scale there. For the generic okay. state. But the, yeah, when you start with, we can see simpler states where they are absolutely suppressed. You can suppress them by one by N where N is the mass of Planck. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so at this point, why don't we uh, give another virtual round of applause for Samir as well as all the speakers in the morning session. So thanks for the nice talks. And then uh, we'll transition into the uh, discussion section for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a short 10 minute uh, coffee break 
bring your own coffee uh, at, at, until the, the afternoon session starts at quarter past the hour. But so for now, uh, let's go ahead and open it up to the to the full uh, discussion for for all three of the of the morning's uh, speakers. So 